Uh, welcome everybody to um, our From Malabar to Coromandel um, Deccan Heritage Art and Culture webinar. Um, we are currently in our second season um, in springtime. Um, and to enter springtime, we have a wonderful lecture today um, by Dr. Nicholas Roth. Um, before I introduce um, our speaker, I just want to say that um, this lecture is being recorded and it will be posted on um, the Center of Islamic Studies um, uh, YouTube site, as well as the Deccan Heritage Foundation's uh, YouTube site. Um, this uh, lecture series is a very unique uh, collaboration between the Center of Islamic Studies in Cambridge, um, the, uh, the Deccan Heritage Foundation, and um, the Sri Sri Kantadatta Narasimha Raja Vadiyar Foundation in Mysore. Um, so this is a really happy uh, confluence of three uh, different and, 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 and good organizations. Um, and so um, uh, if you have any questions, um, please type them in the chat box, but I encourage you to sort of wait until our speaker is done um, uh, because he may have answered your question during the lecture and we will try to get to your questions um, in sort of a thematic order at the end of our lecture today. Um, uh, so uh, today our, um, our lecture is entitled Balsam and Beetle Nut Palm, Botanical Representation in the Early Modern Deccan. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Nicholas Roth. Dr. Nicholas Roth received his PhD in South Asian Studies from Harvard University. His research explores the history of gardens, horticulture and horticulture in early modern India, as well as the material and intellectual culture of the region more broadly. He works with materials in Sanskrit, Persian, and various forms of Hindi and Urdu across a broad array of textual genres, as well as visual sources found in painting and other art forms. Uh, personally, I just like to say that it's very rare to, um, to have a scholar who is committed to multilingualism and um, is also a practicing gardener and, um, and is, is very, very attentive to, um, to the visual. So Helen and I thought it would be a great thing to bring him further south in his research. Um, and he kindly agreed um, <laughs> to give this lecture today. So um, with that, um, I turn over the virtual uh, podium to Nicholas. All right, let me just see if I can share my slides here. My computer is being attacked, so all right. So does that look good? Everyone seeing just a the slides? All right. Yeah. Um, so before I delve into the talk properly, um, I just wanted to say a few more, more words sort of situating um, where this work is at and where it's coming from uh, after this wonderful introduction from Vivek. Um, so this is somewhat unusual for me, much more heavily based on the image rather than the text. I have been working uh, with visual sources and particularly painting uh, for a while, including for my dissertation research, but it's usually been um, to sort of situate the text, you know, as being, you know, <clears throat> in an area studies program, having been trained um, in primarily textual analysis. Uh, whereas this is somewhat new territory for me, not just geographically, because it's focusing on the Deccan, uh, whereas uh, previously while working with some Deccan materials, I've mainly been situated in the Mughal North, um, but it's also really centering the image and looking somewhat, somewhat more art historically um, at, uh, at the evolution and the relationship between images, between representation rather than, um, rather than the text as the primary, primary material. Um, 
The other thing uh, that I wanted to highlight is that perhaps somewhat differently from how we're, we're used to seeing these things approached art historically, um, I, the, the sort of defining um, <clears throat> question for me here uh, was one of botanical verisimilitude or botanical representation as, as in, is in the title of the talk. What that means is that I make a distinction and, um, and I will explain this a bit further in a, in a moment, uh, between representation that encodes actual botanical information, um, the kind of depictions that I as a gardener get excited about because they actually tell me something about plants uh, as opposed to vegetal or floral ornament um, that is sort of divorced from botanical reality. And this, and it's, it's the import of that distinction and, uh, and the, the dynamics of, of, of that botanic specificity that's, that's really some, what I'm trying to trace here. So with that, I want to dive in by beginning with the question of botanical I, regional identity. Um, so it, the Deccan from a, you know, again, coming from a sort of Mughal perspective, and this is uh, this first textual source here that I'm beginning with is a Mughal source, um, is perceived in some realms as a, you know, as a distinct regional uh, entity and as a distinct regional identity. Um, and that for me sort of raises the question, does that relate to, does that correspond to a specific botanical identity? Um, and that seems like a very um, sort of silly question because in, in the real world, obviously um, different areas, different geographic regions are distinguished by uh, a distinct plant palette because of climate, because of soil, because of what the agriculture and horticulture in the area, what people grow. Um, the, the, the flora of a region is often one of the most distinctive things about it. However, coming from uh, studying um, South Asian texts about plants, so uh, the traditions of, of gardening manuals and garden descriptions in Sanskrit and Persian, as well as um, vernaculars like Dakuni Urdu and Braj and Avadi that I have been studying for, for you know, several years now, um, and that are sort of the backbone of my, my dissertation research, uh, that becomes a much more broad question because these in these texts, their regional botanical identity is often negated, um, not explicitly, uh, but implicitly by the sort of repetition of a particular canon of plants dictated as much by literary tradition and cultural import of particular plants as by the actual realities of what could or could not be grown in a particular area. Uh, so it's striking when you see textual as attempts at establishing some sort of association between particular plants and regional identity. So this, uh, this passage here, for example, comes from the Mirado Listila, a Persian um, lexicon of poetic usage, but it's really sort of a um, more of a general um, encyclopedia of interesting information by the Delhi-based um, courtier and, and Persian scholar Anandra and poet Anandra Mukhlis. Uh, it was written in 1745, and in it he has an anecdote under his entry for the betel nut palm, she calls Supari, um, say, talking about uh, the poet Mullah Jamali, uh, which he identifies as Dakuni, um, even though he, if it is the Mullah Jamali that I think it is, uh, he spent his life at the, at, um, at the Lodi court in Delhi. Um, going to Afghanistan to meet uh, Jami, the Persian poet Jami. And Jami asks him, uh, 
that it that you know since supposedly there are no cypress trees in India, what which are commonly used in Persian poetry and, and later in Urdu poetry as well to symbolize the perfect tall elegant figure of the beloved what do Indian poets sort of, um, compare uh, the beloved to and Mullah Jamali says with the betel nut palm because it's also tall and slender and elegant and then he Jami asks him to to recite a verse that illustrates this. He does, as we see here, his stature is a beetle palm. My life and soul lie at his feet. And the, there are puns in there in the in the original Persian that that unfortunately don't really come out in translation. Um, and then Mukhlis specifies, which I think is is Mukhlis's particular interest actually in botanical specificity comes out there because I don't think whether that the anecdote necessarily was primarily about that, but Mukhlis makes it about it that the point of this anecdote is that the betel nut palm is exceedingly beautiful of tall and slender stature, pleasing and delicate, and poor Mukhlis, i.e. he, the author, has observed it a lot in the Deccan. So he associates the betel nut palm at, with the Deccan as a cultural and botanical marker of the Deccan. Um, and we see here, this is a 18th century painting um, from Hyderabad, uh, where we see among mango trees and coconut palms, we see very beautifully, uh, if, if stylized, very beautifully rendered um, betel nut palms. Mukhlis has a similar anecdote about the four o'clock, um, which is a, is a flower, you know, grown in, you know, uh, knee to waist high, it blooms at night. The flowers can have multiple colors in one flower, uh, um, which about which he writes that in India, its blooms open at night. That's actually, you know, it's true everywhere. And the peak of its flowering is during the monsoon. And within India, again, it grows best of all in the Deccan. So again, he associates the, a flower with a particular region. Now, this all seems to point to an attempt to associate geography with particular plants, but there are all sorts of issues with that. Uh, for one thing, the Jami anecdote is sort of built on a false premise. Cypresses did and do grow in India and were because of their import in, in Persian literature and, uh, and Persian net literatures like Urdu were widely and are widely planted in the subcontinent, including in the Deccan. Um, the, the poetic replacement of cypresses with betel nut palms never seems to have actually become terribly popular. There are instances of it, but the cy cypresses are still all over Persian poetry and later Urdu poetry throughout South Asia. Um, <clears throat> and the literary canons more generally are actually quite conservative. Um, and that's true both in Sanskrit and, and sort of more Indic uh, poetic registers and in, uh, and in Persian, in that they have particular plants that they like to mention that they see as being particularly noteworthy. Um, and those plants tend to get used either, whether for symbolism or in the description of, of gardens and so on. Uh, whether it's likely that they were actually grown there or not. Now, the four o'clock is, is a particularly interesting intrusion in that because it's actually native to Mexico. So there is a very real possibility that it was first common in the Deccan, that it first became popular in the Deccan because it probably arrived through the Portuguese co co um, ports on the coast and so probably reached the Deccan um, before it you know, before it really became common in the north. Um, and here we have a mid 17th century Deccani depiction of a four o'clock, then, you know, the, a photo of the plant for comparison. Um, however, we have a, you know, equally realistic, equally well-observed rendering from it that is supposedly from Delhi, uh, you know, from around the same time, maybe marginally later. Um, which if it is indeed from the North, there are some things about it that make me wonder if it might actually be Duckany um, as well, that, you know, 
these plants weren't actually, you know, they were not unknown or probably even uncommon in the North by this point. So all of this is in a sense in the, uh, meant as a sort of preface to, to really complicate this idea of associating particular floras in representation in text or, or image with, uh, with region because that and turns out to be a very complicated issue. Now, when we turn to Dakini art specifically, especially Dakini painting, um, the focus has often been on styles and where what I would call botanical representation, what I would or 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 painting of flowers and plants, um, is sort of you know you know lost at. Uh, <laughs> Uh, for the sake of um, floral fantasies. Um, so, you know, we have this very famous Bijapur painting, for example, from, of a yogini in a landscape, uh, the Chester Beatty, that, uh, you know, is very, very striking and seen it and, and often poses very typically Bijapuri. And while some of the plants are clearly based on a lotus over here, none of the plants are what I would consider botanic representations. They're all floral motifs, vegetable, vegetal, vegetal motifs um, that are sort of fantasy creations. Um, and then, you know, we have famous renderings of things that are quite literally fantasies like the, um, the tree um, bearing human women on the island of Wak Wak from, from sort of Arabic uh, literary tradition uh, in this painting from Golconda and there are other Dakini illustrations of it. Um, there are a lot of these. These are not what I'm interested in. <laughs> um, they are sort of a separate thing for me. And what I really want to focus on is this other mode of representation, which with regard to the Deccan, I think has sort of been ignored a little bit um, because it's as we will see, it's seen as a sort of quintessentially Mughal thing at some point, um, which is the a sort of botanically identifiable, realistic representation of plants, um, and often with the plant as as a main focus of of the artwork, um, and you know, in in things like this flower study or the the study of a um, of a four o'clock we just saw. Uh, so here, these plants actually, this is a impatience balsamina, a balsam, as in the title, we had the betel nut palm. Now this is the balsam of the title. Um, and unlike the four o'clock, this is a plant indigenous to the subcontinent, uh, but it does, from, from my research so far, it does appear in, in clearly identifiable depictions, at least for the early modern period in the Deccan before it does in the North. Um, and a, it's a, you know, it's a common sort of very fast growing garden flower. Uh, and what I sort of wanted to illustrate here is that there is sort of a, a botanically realistic yet very stylized mode that emerges in the Deccan that is, you know, that is identi clearly identifiable as, as Deccani, uh, even though it seems to sort of represent a convergence which was which what is seen as the sort of naturalism of, uh, of botanical painting under the, under the Mughals in the north. And obviously um, these two can't necessarily be separated because even, even before, um, you know, the, the, the last of the Dakini Sultanates fall uh, to Mughal rule at the end of the 17th century. Um, there is, as we will see throughout this presentation, there is, you know, movement of people and ideas and objects um, and artists um, throughout the region. There's clear sort of uh, mutual influence and, and mutual response. Uh, so it's not necessarily that this is that this stays separate from uh, conventions of, of representing plants elsewhere in the, subcon in the subcontinent, um, but there does seem to be a distinct idiom of rendering um, 
botanically specific uh, detailed plants that emerges in the Deccan, uh, which which stays somewhat distinct, and I think, and actually, it has, as we will see, influences um, other other uh, parts of the subcontinent later on. Uh, and just in formal terms, uh, what it's really character characterized by uh, is great, great botanic detail, which somewhat paradoxically is um, is married to a considerable amount of of stylization in terms of symmetry or or um, repetition of elements, uh, often outlining, um, you know, in dark, dark outlining of the of the shapes of, of plant parts, um, and these these sort of brilliant jewel tones, um, and, uh, and the sort of um, manipulation of proportions. And uh, as we see here with the sort of, you know, tiny miniature flowers relative to the to the completely oversized main flower, um, as well as a sort of you know, fantasy landscape setting for, for things like flower studies, uh, which are usually on plain ground in the north. So just to sort of illustrate this again, um, how this sort of see here, we have a, um, in a sense, Dakini Mughal, since it's produced in Aurangabad, um, which is, you know, part of, part of what's already the, the Mughal Deccan uh, in, in 1669. Uh, illustration of a chrysanthemum from a Sanskrit manuscript, the Siddhan, um, of the Siddhanta Sara philosophical text, um, in comparison with a Avadi, uh, so sort of late Mughal Mughal successor state uh, study of a, of a chrysanthemum um, produced a century later. Uh, and then from around the same time, a very realistic uh, watercolor of a, of a chrysanthemum. Uh, again, always the same sort of small white flowered variety, which seems to have been dominant in pre-colonial South Asia um, from the, from Garval, from, from the sort of foothills of the Himalayas. And, you know, we'll see this again, what's sort of striking here, you see, you see this much greater stylization, the outlining, um, the, you know, gold and brilliant jewel tones in the Dakini version, but then you also see that the Dakini version and the Avadi version actually share this somewhat unnatural habit and, and arrangement of the flowers and buds compared to the very realistic sort of chrysanthemums are very stiff plants, um, much more much more stiff realistic arrangement in the um, in the Garhwal illustration. Um, that might well speak to a closer relationship between these two. Um, and, and this will come up again, um, you know, and people like Keelan Overton and Deborah Hutton have, have pointed to the potential relationship uh, or in some cases an established relationship between Dakini uh, painting and, and Avadi painting, if, but not necessarily for, for botanical illustration. So just to return briefly to the Mughals um, as a point of comparison, uh, you know, for the Mughals, floral painting has been studied somewhat more extensively because it's so prominent in, in many ways in Mughal ornament. Uh, and one of the main sort of things that has that has been studied in highlight with that regard is the extent to which Mughal artists drew on European florilegia, so European print books of flowers um, for their floral motifs, including often of flowers that they wouldn't have seen in real life in India. So we, here we have a page that Ustad Mansur, who is known as a famous flower and animal painter, although we only have two of his flower studies, this and then a more uh, from observation one, which we'll see on the next slide, um, that sort of highlight how, um, you know, how he took this Dutch floral printer, um, Netherlandish floral print, and, you know, colored, copied it and, and, and sort of filled it with colors based on what looked nice because he didn't actually know what the flowers were for the most part. He clearly knew what a pink rose was, but the lilies he would not have been have seen in real life. Now, this is the other surviving flower painting we have by, by Ostad Mansur, which is clearly based on observation. It's a tulipa lanata, a tulip species that grows in Kashmir and, and what is now Northern Pakistan. Um, very famous. Again, sort of, it's been argued that it, it 
copies European floor, you know, conventions of flower painting with the inclusion of the insects and the arrangement, um, but it's very naturalistic and very clearly based on a observed specimen that you would have found in the sort of Northwest Indian Himalayas. So clearly there are parallels here, probably a relationship between these sort of flower studies and what we see in the Deccan, but the, the idiom still remains distinct. Now, <clears throat> I wanna talk, just briefly talk a little bit about the antecedents to, to this potential difference in idiom in, in the Deccan. So for, we have a very robust tradition in the Deccan based on the manuscript record of these Persian Arabic Yunani, uh, ultimately Greek medicine pharmacopoeias and, and De Materia Medica um, of Dios Caridis uh, translations, both in Persian and Arabic, which have a very distinct manner of botanical illustration, um, which we'll see here. So this is actually a Dakani, probably Bijapur example. Um, here is one from the 11th century from Samarkand. Here is one from Iran from the 13th century. Um, here is one from Iran from the beginning of the 17th. Um, and these illustrations are very, they're, they're very schematic. They oftentimes are unidentifiable if you don't know, if you don't have the accompanying text, essentially, if you can't read the accompanying text. Um, they're sort of visual mnemonics. If you know the plant, if you can read the text and you actually know what the plant looks like in real life, then they highlight the salient characteristics of it for you and, and sometimes just the salient characteristics for their medical use. Um, but outside of that, they're not botanical illustrations. Um, uh, so they're heavily stylized. They're also surprisingly very, very consistent over this huge period of time and um, geography, not in that they always look exactly the same, but in that the, the sort of idiom, the style, the convention stay very, very similar. Um, we have numerous examples of this from the Deccan, seemingly very few to none from the North, even though the tradition would have almost certainly been, been known, they don't seem to have been produced in the North. Um, with the example of this, and this is like the previous page, this too is a hazelnut, supposed to be a hazelnut tree, um, which was produced probably in Bengal in the 1790s for a European official who commissioned a number of, um, of local sort of works on agriculture and, and, and related things. <clears throat> uh, just case in point, the, the hazelnut trees on this page and the previous page um, you know, are basically just a tree with green leaves and little nuts on them. Uh, so it could be completely nondescript without the accompanying text. Uh, they're also very likely based on an original, on like an original inspiration that was based on what is known as the Turkish hazel, which isn't usually used for food purposes, but which has this single tall trunk, as opposed to um, the more common cultivated hazelnut, which has a, which is a multi-stemmed sort of suckering shrub. Um, uh, so there's a there's a good chance here that at some point someone created a prototype that was more that lived in an area, you know, eastern Turkey, northeastern Iran, Caucasus, uh, northwestern Iran, Caucasus, somewhere around there, where the Turkish hazel uh, would have been more familiar, and that then became reproduced. Another another potential source uh, or connection of, of earlier sort of botanical imagery that I just wanted to briefly highlight, also because it connects us to the previous wonderful lecture in the series by Professor Kali Gotla, uh, is in medieval um, temple sculpture where we do actually have uh, depictions, especially of flowering trees and fruiting trees. Uh, so here we have on the left from Badami, uh, what is probably an Ashoka tree in bloom. And on the right, a flowering, uh, a fruiting mango tree from the Virupaksha temple in Patadakal. Um, not directly related perhaps, but, um, but still intriguing in terms of how things come to be st stylized in the later idiom. So what we just saw there, for example, just as, as is the mango, <laughs> and uh, just to sort of 
give you an idea of, of the somewhat shifting, but I think still distinct um, manner of, of uh, botanical representation. Uh, we, have the, we have the mango tree with these sort of very even clusters of fruit emerging very clearly uh, from, these, uh, from the tips of the branches the, with the whirl of leaves around them, um, which is very true, is very, a very accurate analysis of the habit of how the plant grows, but then it gets repeated in this perfect arrangement, um, uh, which is, you know, sort of makes it into a somewhat stylized pattern. Uh, and we see this throughout a lot of, um, or most of the Dakini representations of mango trees, uh, whereas uh, in, in Mughal and, and, and later Avadi and Murshidabad and whatnot, depictions of mango trees uh, in the north, we often, um, that, that how the leaves and the fruit relate is, is oftentimes not worked out nearly as clearly. Also, the fruit is usually of uniform color, whereas in the Deccan, we, very, we predominantly uh, again, with this love for jewel tones, uh, we see these multicolored uh, clusters of mangoes, which of course might also just speak to the predominance of particular varieties in the Deccan that, you know, that shift as they ripen between greens and yellows and oranges, as opposed to predominantly all green or all yellow varieties in other parts of the subcontinent. So here's just more examples um, across, uh, across sort of the, the 17th and eight, uh, 18th century of these sort of depictions of mango trees in, in Dakini painting. Um, similar, returning to the betel nut palm, um, we have a similar sort of, you know, consistent rendering. So here we have a, you know, Golconda painting of a dancing girl. Um, we have the betel nut palm on the left here, very clearly rendered ne next to a what is presumably supposed to be a coconut palm, but is so stylized as to be essentially meaningless. But then on the right, we have very intriguingly, a very naturalistically rendered um, star gooseberry. Uh, nothing to do with the real gooseberry. It's a, it's a relative of, of the amla tree, which is also called Indian gooseberry with very acidic, very high vitamin C fruits. Um, in North India, the, the quote unquote, the amla, the Indian gooseberry predominates in many parts of the Deccan. We get this species, Phalantus acidus, the star gooseberry much more frequently. And you see this sort of repetition of its representation in painting, uh, again, very sort of identifiably rendered. We have the, the detail from the dancing girl painting on the left here. And this on the right is actually uh, from a century earlier from the sort of most elaborate, most ornate known manuscript of the Kitab in Nora, so Sultan Ibrahim Adil Shah of Bija, the second of Bijapur. Um, uh, this folio being at the Cleveland Museum of Art, other folios are at the National Museum in Delhi, where again on the right, while most of the other plants are what I would consider again, these floral fantasies, on the right, we have the star gooseberry, the Philanthus acidus clearly rendered Interesting enough, again, mirroring what seem to be palm trees on the other side in this arrangement very similar to the Golconda painting a century later. And this is just to show you what the plant actually looks like um, and to sort of show you how the clusters of fruit and the very particular foliage and arrangement of that foliage, how closely those are actually rendered in, in these depictions. Now, the Kitab in uh, sort of I makes a nice transition to um, more specifically to Bijapur art. And uh, because we have, because it is from Bijapur and the sort of heyday of, of Bijapur as a creative center. Um, and it has these uh, very particular vase designs, which reappear in a number of other contexts, including in the wall paintings of the Asar Mehel in Bijapur, uh, where they, where very particular flowers emerge from these sort of ornate fantasy vases. Uh, so here on the right, we have a niche where a stylized but very clearly identifiable um, red hibiscus, a hibiscus rosa sinensis. Um, so it's more, also used to be called a shoe flower, uh, emerges from this vase in a niche 
Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, this is the this is the sort of room as a whole uh, that this is part of. The other niches have similarly stylized oleander emerging from from such vases, um, and in between are pigeon pea vines, which. Um, according to Sabrowski, uh, actually our later edition, they so apparently date to the 19th century, uh, which are in a sort of much more realistic idiom. Um, you know, you can see them there compared to the real plant in my garden last summer. Um, but really, you know, and sort of raise the question of whether this is a content continuation and, and further development of a local sort of botanical idiom or whether they're just a completely new, new intervention because for all their stylization, the original floral designs in the talks, in the niches um, are, you know, encode a wealth of accurate botanical information. Um, they're very clearly and immediately identifiable if you know the plants that they're based on. Um, along a similar line, continuing with this sort of vase, um, vase motif, uh, here we have a, uh, a decoupage page, uh, again, from Bijapur with a number of, uh, of garden flowers. Um, you know, we've got a marigold here, then a, a rose, and a an, uh, corn poppy, and then some white irises down here. And again, these are just sort of the real flower, real photos, photograph flowers for comparison. Um, again, rendered in this uh, not exactly realistic, but nonetheless very, very detailed and very, um, very distinctive idiom. And with that, I just wanted to come back briefly to this painting and to sort of enumerate exactly how many flowers are clearly identifiable. And if we have the four o'clock, which is the main player, um, but then we also have again a balsam, very similar to the one we previously saw. A Joseph's coat, amaranth, poppies, larkspur, a marigold, another new world introduction at, um, that would have been fairly new at this point. A, well, would have been around for about a, for maybe half a century to a century at this point, but it's one of the first to arrive from Mexico. A coxcomb, a tulip, uh, which presumably would have been borrowed from another artwork since it wouldn't have grown locally in the Deccan and some sort of mallow, this one being the only one that's not very precisely identifiable. And continuing on sort of with the with this particularly Bijapuri iteration of, of these flower uh, depictions, um, I wanted to turn to this Ragamala from late 18th century Bijapur. So post Mughal already Nizami Bijapur um, that contains an incredible wealth. So these are from separate, you know, we have one folio here on the left, which is the wealth of, of botanicals. And then on the right, um, just a small fraction of the identifiable species uh, on other folios of the manuscript. Um, so you have tube roses, grapevines, and again, this hibiscus, uh, a plumeria, pomegranates, narcissi, roses, again, the four o'clock, a custard or, or sugar apple, which again, which also was a new introduction from Mexico, like so many of the flowers, the tubros as well, um, which are all minutely rendered and they're both, they're not naturalistic in the sense that we see in, that is sort of celebrated from Mughal art, but they're all perfect, representations of the botanical specifics of these plants. And they show a clear continuity, I believe, to um, what we saw almost two centuries earlier in the Asar Mah um, Mahel imagery. And again, just another example here, we have a another Ragamala from another Ragamala series of flower bed with roses, tuberose, iris, marigold. Now, to wrap up, I just wanted to highlight two sort of case studies um, 
of particular plants that I that I think speak a little bit to the way some of this imagery might have moved. And this is uh, this is I think what really bears further investigation, if if possible. Um, so one of these is the champaka, uh, which is a type of magnolia, not a plumeria, not a frangipani. Although in a lot of Indian languages today, the name champa has been extended to that again New World Mexican species. Um, so the original champa is a type of magnolia that is native to the subcontinent, uh, but loves sort of moist tropical conditions. So it's actually challenging to grow in in many areas. Uh, it's, however, standard part of the sort of floral inventory. Uh, it's one of the flowers that the Sanskrit tradition really celebrates. Because of that, it gets picked up in Indian Persian really early. Amir Khusro already writes about it in the Nusipir, sort of celebrating India's, India's wealth uh, of beautiful things. Um, however, it is so in it rarely appears in imagery in the north until very late, it does appear very ubiquitously in Dakini art uh, from, from my finding, at least in the, in the early modern period. So here we have whole champaka trees, again, from that Bijapuraga Mala. This is a painting of uh, uh, Abul Hassan Qutub Shah, the last uh, Qutub Shah ruler of Golconda, holding and smelling a, a champaka flower. And then here, we have Mohammad Adichal of Bijapur, again, holding a champaka flower and one of those red orange mangoes. Um, and this is in a sense to me, this is telling because it, this holding a flower motif for rulers we see in the North as well. We also see it with the Safavids and the Ottomans, uh, but in the North, it's almost always a pink damask rose or, or a narcissus. Um, whereas in, in the Deccan, the single most common flower for it uh, seems to be a champa. Um, and similarly suggestive here, I have, a, I have a poem by Abu Talib Kalim Kashani about the champa or champaka, uh, which he wrote in describing a garden in Agra for Shah Jahan um, after he, uh, he, from 1632 onwards, he's, um, he's the poet laureate, the Malik Ashura of the, of the Mughal court. Um, and he's, he's originally from Iran. Um, and, but he is, but he does start his Indian career in the Deccan. He's originally works at the Bijapur court. Um, and, it, and as far as I know, he's the first um, Persian poet working um, in the sort of Mughal context to hone in on the champa in this manner. And it does, it does sort of raise the question of whether its prominence for him uh, was sort of part of, of his Dakini cultural experience um, along with the, the sort of imagery. And along similar lines, uh, we have a sort of progression of this hibiscus imagery, this very particular hibiscus imagery. So we had the Asamahel one, then we have in the late Shah Jahan album, uh, they, the, um, a similar sort of hibiscus, which is the only, the first Mughal one that I've, I've come across temp chronologically appear in the margins. Then again, we have that Bijapur Ragamala. And then we have this red hibiscus from, from Avat from the late 18th century uh, that's been attributed to Mirchand um, it and likely perhaps if not by Mirchan himself, at least the, the, the atelier, the workshop of, of Paul Ye, um, a sort of Swiss French uh, courtier in Avad. Uh, and we know thanks to the, to the work of, of Keelan Overton, uh, for instance, um, that that workshop collected and reproduced uh, and copied um, Avadi and specifically Bijapuri painting um, and uh, my friend Bronwyn Gulkis, who I, I think is, uh, is attending the talk, uh, has a lot more, I'm sure, to say about this and knows this much better than me. Um, but it sort of raises uh, the distinct possibility that you have this particular uh, hibiscus motif uh, also traveling as a, um, as a Dakini, uh, as a sort of, you know, Dakini import to the late Mughal Abadi context. Um, 
specifically because you have these very distinctive features that go all the way back to the SMHL version of the very minute relative to what it is like in real life uh, foliage, um, the buttons at various stages, um, the lack of the of any representation of the style and the, the pistol of the flower, which in most hibiscus varieties is very prominent. Uh, instead, the sort of abundance of petals, and we see that across all four depictions, and the, the very sort of effusive rendering of these little leaf projections at the, at the nodes and around the buds um, that are sort of a, this, you know, a, a distinctive feature of this type of hibiscus. Um, but are sort of very, very minuscule. They're really prominent in, in these renderings. Plus, of course, in the floral study, again, the, the sort of, this, you know, un, unnatural proportions, the single stem emerging as if it were a tree from a, from a fantasy landscape, the, the rich gold background, um, which we saw in, in other, of the, uh, of other Deccani floral studies. Uh, tellingly, uh, the, the, uh, hibiscus or gurhal is also one of the uh, one is also another flower that um, that Kalim writes about in that same garden uh, garden description where he talks about the champa uh, and other than that he talks primarily about flowers from the Persian canon. Um, so I wanted to end just briefly on the painting that uh, you see an saw an excerpt off on the email that went out about. Um, about this talk, which is from the very end of the 18th century from Hyderabad, probably by Venka Chelam. Um, <clears throat> it's a courtly scene, but we sort of see in the back the sort of beautiful rendering of these stylized, yet very precise botanicals. We have a false Ashoka, a jackfruit, uh, the beetle palms, cypresses, coconut palms, banana, and the plumeria, um, which again, is sort of a relatively new and rarely depicted American introduction um, at this time. Uh, and we really also see here the sort of, uh, again, emerging of more of the Indic corpus of, of plants usually mentioned literary. The jackfruit, for example, uh, is part of, of virtually every garden description we get in, in the Sanskritic texts and in Indian vernaculars. Um, but very rarely gets depicted um, in other parts of the region until uh, I think we really start sort of seeing the influence of, of Dakini painting elsewhere. Um, so I'm going to stop there. I know I've, I know I've gone on for quite a while. Um, I'm very excited to, for questions and to um, maybe flesh some of these things out more in response to, to what interests you. Okay. Thank you, Nick. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, you took us into a garden. If you want to stop sharing your screen and we can... Um... Okay, so um, we are, I'm going to give our audience a bit of a, um, a chance to um, think about your presentation um, and ask questions. We already have one um, question, but... Um, before I open it up, I just want to ask uh, a small question about how quickly um, foreign imported uh, plant species get illustrated in um, in in these um, in painting or in other media um, uh, once they arrive. So you you had um, you had referred to a lot of these. Um, imports from Mexico. Um, and I was wondering the rate at which those, uh, you know, from the time that they arrive in the Deccan or in South Asia more generally, um, to the point that they are incorporated in other media, be it painting, um, textiles, um, other, other sorts of media. So I'm, I'm curious about this uh, relationship. So that's um, that is an excellent question, uh, and it's something that I've um, that I've tried to to really get a handle on um, for years now. Um, and what it seems to be the case is that it. And again, this is where I think the interplay of image and text and convention play such a big role, because it varies dramatically um, from plant to plant. Um, so the the most extreme example of adoption across media that 
um, that I have found uh, is the marigold, um, which can't have arrived much earlier than than the very than the second half. It can't really have arrived earlier than the second half of the sixteenth of the sixteenth century. And by the first or second decade of the of the seventeenth century, it is everywhere. It is in all the texts about gardens. It is um, not not the technical texts, not the gardening manuals, but in the in the sort of poetic and literary descriptions of gardens. Um, and it's in painting, both in the Mughal context uh, and in and and seemingly in the Deccan. Um, it also shows up on fabrics in Iran. Um, and one so basically wherever the marigold goes, it seems to get incorporated remarkably quickly. On the other end of the spectrum, you have things like the um, you have things like the plumeria, which probably didn't arrive terribly much later, um, and certainly uh, you know also qu relatively quickly seem to have probably enjoyed success in the real world but very, very slowly and only entered the pictorial record. So the, um, the earliest plumeria depictions um, that, that I can really point to are these 18th century ones, sort of middle to late 18th century ones in, in the Deccan. Um, and then a, and then similarly from about the same time period, uh, maybe a tad bit earlier, uh, but also less sort of botanically precise uh, in Bundi in Rajasthan. Um, nowhere else have I so far found any trace of, uh, of depictions of plumerias prior to, prior to col the colonial period. Um, so okay. it, it, it's a, it, it, it sort of really, really runs the gamut, interesting enough, but the overall pattern that I, I think I'm starting to see is that Visually, in terms of visual depiction, the, the Deccan seems to have been slightly more open to the new, um, but then it also obviously received some of these plants first. I mean, another question that occurs to me while you were talking is whether or not um, the botanical evidence, um, it, it's these, you know, thinking in terms of Mughal and Deccan, um, you know, the divide between the two, it, the botanical evidence actually cuts across these, these exactly. media um, and, and actually uh, sort of pokes holes in that kind of historiography um, that I think the field is hopefully starting to move away from um, in, 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 in some ways. Um, you know, the, the, this, uh, this example that you gave of, um, of Polier um, is, is fantastic. Um, and I think that, you know, I, th I think that it's, it's an extremely uh, rich one. Can you talk a little bit more about this, you know, Deccan Mughal divide or, or, or whether there's uh, any specific or whether there's... Yes. Uh, um, so again, this is sort of very much still, still initial for me. And, and there are a few things that I think I, 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 I would like to say, but one is that um, I, in my previous research, I did work with, with Deccani materials, um, but there's a reason I, um, I generally didn't engage with the Duncan with, with sort of Duncan materials as distinct until I looked at at you know at painting more extensively where where style or idiom is is distinct uh, is the fact that textually uh, that doesn't seem to be be a clear distinction in the sense that you know if you look at gardening literature and garden descriptions um, uh, you know, there's Ali Akbar Hussein's work that sort of established that um, you have these elaborate and very detailed, very botanically detailed uh, descriptions of gardens in in um, in Dakni Urdu Masnavis, um, and you know, and my work sort of very quickly led to the to the conclusion that um, that was actually a larger trend across the subcontinent from the 16th century onward, where across vernaculars and then eventually in Persian as well in the north, um, you get these, these ever more elaborate uh, descriptions of gardens for the sake of describing gardens, these ekphrases of gardens um, with this great botanical detail. So in the, on a textual level, it is a, it is a sort of weird distinction. And, and with the images, 
again, it's it's just very hard to sort of sort out uh, the mutual influence, especially with my focus sort of more on the um, you know on the on the more early modern period. Um, the two are always already interacting at that point, um, and you know you're. Uh, you know, you have written about about Burhanpur as sort of an in between space, um, and including for for floral imagery that sort of undermines the the potential uh, Mughal Mughal Dakini divide. Uh, I know Bronwyn um, also has has various points um, of things she's looking at, where um, again, in some cases involving florals that that sort of undermine that. Um, so yeah, I think I think there. On the one hand, I think there is a there's a distinct there's this distinct mode because it does have sort of distinct Dakini styles that have distinctive features of rendering botanical, quote unquote, realism of encoding the the realness of a plant, um, and and a distinct sort of treatment of when to represent a real plant as to as opposed to when to just produce vegetal vegetal motifs vegetal ornament. Um, but that develops and um, you know emerges and develops, I think, already in conversation um, with with representational modes uh, elsewhere in the subcontinent. And also, what I really didn't uh, didn't touch upon here, uh, because it sort of just made the scope even more unwieldy, uh, is <clears throat> Raj is Rajput painting in in what is now Rajasthan and and adjacent areas. Um, uh, as part of this, because um, uh, because there there are all sorts of very clear, I think, links uh, back and forth uh, between uh, between Rajasthan and the Deccan, and in with regard to floral depictions, the uh, the museum note, for example, for that Bijapur um, ragamala that is such a wealth of botanical information attributes. Uh, it's it's sort of wealth of flower paintings to the migration of Rajasthani painters to Bijapur, sort of post Mughal, um, and I I actually I think that link is there, but I wonder whether that's actually the direction of it, um, and to what degree it wasn't Mughal, it wasn't actually Dakini modes that that influenced a lot of. Um, a lot of developments in, in the depiction of flowers in, in parts of Rajasthan. So, so the chat is getting very active and, <laughs> and, and, and we have a lot of enthusiasm for your talk, which is obvious, um, but, um, but I, I, and there are lots of detailed oriented questions and I, I do want to sort of bracket those off for a moment. I know that you love engaging with those as well, but I do want to ask two questions that I think are kind of are, are very important. One comes from Beatrice Campy, uh, which who asks um, whether or not towards, you know, the later part of the early modern period with the advent of, of what is sometimes called company painting, um, mm -hmm. whether or not there is a shift towards more detail um, in, in botanical illustration because of those. Um, and then another question um, comes from Charlotte uh, Giles, hi Charlotte, um, is um, is about um, you know whether or not there's um, there's a, it's a very general question um, whether or not there's a difference between illustration on um, in uh, in uh, across media so whether or not it when it appears on clothing um, and I think we also have Sylvia Hotelling on this call so I'm sure she could talk a lot about textiles and clothing, um, but whether or not you're seeing anything um, about the depiction on, uh, on, um, on, on different media. Um. Um, okay, so with regard to the, um, with regard to company painting, um, it's, it's sort of a, it's sort of an odd thing. I don't really necessarily see a, a shift to, to necessarily greater detail um, in the sense that there are definitely pre, they're definitely like squarely Mughal and squarely Dakini um, depictions of plants that, and, and including floral studies or, or plant studies that, that encode as much specific detail about the plant um, as they, as sort of, you know, later company paintings do, at least the sort of most, most brilliant ones. 
And including in the Mughal case, the Dakini case, there usually, you know, there is that stylization. In the Mughal case, there are some that are, I would also say are sort of, you know, photorealist as the, um, to use a, in a, in, in accurate term, uh, as the, 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 um, as the, the sort of later company paintings are. So I, so I don't think there's necessarily a, a, a shift. What I do think though, uh, or at least what I've been wondering about is the extent to which these different, uh, these different modes or idioms of, um, of flower painting uh, between North and South, if not strictly, you know, Deccan and Mughal perhaps, impact the company painting that are produced company paints that are produced in Bengal versus in, in the sort of Madras presidency uh, um, and in, in sort of courts that are, that are in, in that in-between space. So for example, the, um, the Tanjavur uh, uh, Saraswati Mahal library collection of botanical paintings, which, are, which were done for a local patron, so they're not company painting uh, per se, but stylistically, you know, and in terms of their sort of European botanical commitments, they, they are in many ways in line with company painting, but in their, in their sort of um, ornamental qualities compared to the, you know, um, com compared to the Bengal ones, they, they seem much more Dakuni to, you know, they are, they're much more um, sort of playful and, and curvy linear and, um, and sort of highly highly outlined um, than um, you know than the work of Sheikh uh, Zainuddin and Bhavani does and, and whatnot in, in, in Bengal. Um, so I think they're because of the artists' training and what they've been exposed to, there's probably a, a, an influence there. Um, with regard to fabrics, I perf purposefully sidestep fabrics here because I, I do not really feel ready to to delve into them fully. Um, I think there is definitely somewhat of a shift uh, because I, uh, in, in botanical specificity in the sense to, that fabric almost, I think, demands a, the textiles demand a, a greater stylization, um, which lends itself on the other hand to the sort of Dakini idiom. Um, so, you know, those, those archetypal poppies um, that we see all over the place, uh, you know, work really well in that sort of sort of slight abstraction. Um, so yeah, it, it looks different once when it's on textiles, but I can't I can't necessarily um, and and it's botanical identifiability because of that becomes rarer. So we don't. You know, there's lots and lots of poppies. We don't see a terrible amount of like more more uncommon flowers and whatnot in fabric from from my sort of you know far from exhaustive uh, perusal. Um, but on the other hand, there are you know there there are certainly instances. So for example, I've seen a I've seen a toddy palm on a um, on a on a on a palampur sheet um, uh, that that is clearly botanically identifiable and, and very much in this Dakini mode. So there is, there is crossover, I would so, venture. I'm going to read um, one last question, but everyone who has asked a question, we will stay on after we formally end the lecture to answer some of the more detailed oriented questions. But, um, but Alice West asks, whether or not there's a dictionary of Deccani plants, I wish they were, illust or <laughs> illustrated with the art of the period. And she encourages you to make one. Uh, <laughs> and she will ask you um, another question. Thanks, Alice. At, at some point. Um, I, I also wanted to note that um, we are aware that there is some, there has been some confusion about the timing of these lectures um, uh, because of the, the shift in, um, in daylight savings. Uh, but uh, Nicholas has kindly agreed to put this lecture online. Um, so, so please join me in thanking Nicholas for a wonderful um, lecture today. Um, and um, I, will, I, I will just say that um, our next lecture is on April 30th with Julia A.B. Hegewald, um, uh, who will be speaking 
um, on Jaina Temple Architecture of Coastal Karnataka, Climatic Dependencies and Artistic Freedoms. And Helen, would you like to just close our session for us today and with any questions or comments? Can't hear you. Helen, we can't hear you. Now? Yes, now we can yes. hear you. There you okay. go. Well, I wanted to say that it was a most enjoyable lecture. Very interesting. I love flowers and I love plants. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was really a pleasure. And the, the miniatures you chose were absolutely wonderful. I wanted to ask you on some of the stucco work, with which I work mm -hmm. a lot in the pre in the period that precedes whatever you talked about. Uh, the you have a lot of uh, um, flowers that go back to local traditions, much more mm -hmm. than flowers that you would expect to find, let's say, in an Islamic garden. And what you also find, it's not a flower, it's a fruit uh, in, uh, in funerary monuments. Uh, and that relates more to Vivek's uh, question regarding the time span between the arrival of a plant and its uh, uh, presentation, it is representation, is the uh, pineapple. You mm -hmm. find pineapples on three monuments, all of which date from the middle of the, um, of the 16th century. And uh, um, obviously, the pineapple arrived with the Portuguese, uh, and it was, I've never seen it had anywhere else but in funerary monuments. Interesting. And I've also wondered why I, is it in funerary, in 16th, late 16th and 17th century, that's when they appear. We have it in, uh, we have it in, uh, um, in a monument in Gulbarga, we have it in Afsalpur, um, we have it, which is near Bijapur, then we have it in Golconda um, and at the tomb of Abdallah in uh, the Qutub Shahid tombs. So I, oh, I, I no. what's going I on? What happened. Okay. We have to kick this person off, whoever this is. Okay. Okay. So we are left. <laughs> <laughs> we don't so, know what's happening here, but someone is sharing their screen. Yeah. That, that shouldn't be. <laughs> I know. Someone who is not. A part of our yeah. So it. You know, can we kick this person off? I think that the time. Oh, it's over. It's over. There we go. Yeah. There you go, Helen. Yes. No. I. I, I thought that this time, the difference in time, between. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that the, the the pineapple arrived in India, at about the turn of the uh, century. I mean, in around the early 16th century, and then mm -hmm. it starts to be represented about 40 years later, 50 years later for specific things only. And I was wondering whether there is a, we know anything about it because. So, so the pineapple is interesting, um, has been interesting to me from, from you know, working on from Mughal sources because the pineapple is one of the very few of the new American, new quote unquote American plants um, whose arrival and foreign origin is acknowledged in the sources. So the marigold, for example, uh, just appears and is treated as, as a regular flower, as a ubiquitous flower without any sort of, like there's nothing about it arriving, nothing of it being ever not, not being there, et cetera. Whereas with the pineapple, the, um, the Ayna Akbari reports that it was first in the, in the Firangi ports mm -hmm. um, and since then has sort of become more common across North India. And that gets, and also that you can easily, you know, Abul Fazl also reports that you can easily transport it in a container mm -hmm. and replant it, um, mm -hmm. which speaks to the sort of mobility of it because it's not a big, probably because it's not a big tree and because it, you know, it has a short life cycle. Um, and so there is a memory there of it being foreign and that gets reproduced, you know, all the way through to the 18th century. So Mukhlis, you know, still cites Abul Fazl to say, you know, that it used to not be common and, and then it is common. Uh, Jahangir also comments on it and so on. Um, uh, and Mukhlis also comments on the fact that uh, if you are in an area where they're not widely grown, then that they're suitable for formal gift giving. So mm -hmm. he, said, he says that like a couple of decades ago, they were still not, while well, they were known, they were still not very readily available in Delhi. So a pineapple made a good gift in Delhi. Um, but then they started uh, being grown in large numbers in, in Ghaziabad. 
uh, and sort of it became easily accessible in Delhi, so now they're not a good gift anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, in visual representations, they're relatively rare in um, in the in the movie context as well. I have yet to see an architectural representation of them. I can send you. I can show you. In 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 the in the Mughal context. No, I um, think my context is pre-Mughal, and you have representations. But the but the album but the album depiction but the few album depictions that do exist um, are in the Mughal context are sort of concurrent to this. So they're also you know they're beginning and middle of the 17th century. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a painting of uh, of Jahangir uh, with a tray that includes a pineapple in front of him, and then there is a Shah Jahan era painting of a posthumous Shah Jahan era painting of Akbar with a whole pineapple plant at his feet. But why is it on funerary monuments only? At I least don't, we don't know. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't know. And it's and it's clearly and it's clearly distinct from the the, the no, Mughal use of them. Symbolic connotation. Yeah. Which we don't know. Anyway, thank you so much. It was really really wonderful, and we hope to see you again in some other <laughs> um, in our next uh, webinars. And uh, Vivek already mentioned that we, our next webinar will be. Julia Hegewald, who's uh, uh, who also is going to present us her new the new guidebook that the Deccan Heritage has published on uh, the giant monuments of the Deccan. So um, thank you so much for this most enjoyable lecture. Thank you, yes. Nicholas. Thank you, Nicholas. So this this is the formal end of our of our yes. session.